Hi everyone, welcome back. Uh, this is the second video, so chapters eight through the end of the book. Um, things that are more recent in the semester, so I'm gonna go a little bit faster um, and really just highlight things that, um, uh, that I think are less obvious or less well explained in the book than we've discussed in class. Um, so chapter eight, um, thinking and intelligence, cognition and intelligence, um, one of the important things to look at here, um, it talks about problem solving, and I, you know, I'll leave you to look through that. Um, al the difference between an algorithm and a heuristic, an algorithm is a set of rules that you could go through one by one and you would arrive at a guaranteed solution. When you think of a math problem um, that has a solution, you go through it step by step and you can solve that math problem using an algorithm. Heuristics are mental shortcuts um, and they take us um, from point A to maybe not A to Z, but maybe A to X or A to Y. Um, and then we can correct for that once we get there. It's a mental shortcut. Um, two common heuristics, the availability heuristic and the representative representativeness heuristic. Um, availability is how quickly you can think of it. Um, so when somebody says, are you more likely to die in a plane accident or a car accident? And you think, well, you know, I've read a lot about plane accidents and those seem to be super fatal. Um, and car accidents I sometimes survive from or I hear that people sometimes survive from. So I'm gonna go with planes and yet uh, the statistics are not in your favor. So that's availability, how quickly you can think of it. Representativeness is um, what's the prototype for that and how closely does this match what your prototype or what your expectations are um, of what, your, what, the, uh, what the sort of norm is for that. I think the example that's used in your book is price. Um, if something costs more, um, you know, we, we sort of associate that with quality. It must have cost more to make, it must be of a better quality, um, perhaps it's a better, um, it's a better thing. Um, paradox of choice we've already talked about in class. Um, when you look at the theories of intelligence, um, there's a typo in the study guide that says theories of multiple intelligences. That is one of the theories of intelligence. Um, remember our discussion about what intelligence is um, and what it's not, um, and then uh, different theories of how it works. So the theories are Spearman's G, the idea that there's a general intelligence that pervades everything, um, and that people who are generally intelligent would be good at whatever they chose to do, and that might be uh, being a professional basketball player, that might be being an astrophysicist, that might be being um, a doctor, it might be a teacher, whatever it is, they would have been really good at whatever it was that they did. Um, so that's Spearman's G, general intelligence, it's usually a small g. Um, the next one is Gardner's multiple intelligences, um, and that's the idea that there are these multiple intelligences, and you could be good at any any one of them in different quantities. So some people are really good at language and linguistics, some people are really good at dance, some people are really good at um, analytical types of things, math, um, spatial, um, spatial ability, uh, you know, naturalist. Um, so you can go through the list of Gardner's multiple intelligences and the idea was that these are separate forms of intelligence. The third one is Sternberg's triarchic theory of intelligence, the, intelligence, the idea that um, there's analytical or componential experiment uh, intelligence, which suggests that you're book smart, right? Somebody who does classically well in school um, would be high in analytical intelligence. High in creative intelligence is just what it sounds like. Somebody who can think in novel ways, think outside the box, come up with creative solutions and create things. Um, and then practical intelligence is street smarts, just being a, the, the kind of person that you would want to have with you if you were stranded on a desert island, somebody who can look at a situation and come up with a practical solution. So Sternberg thought about it that way. And then the fourth one that's in that table in your book is the difference between fluid and crystallized intelligence. Fluid intelligence is your ability to quickly understand something, come up with novel solutions. Um, people who are high in fluid intelligence tend to be in their 20, 25, 30 range, and it declines somewhat, not dramatically, but it declines somewhat across the adult lifespan. Crystallized intelligence, when you think about crystals, forming crystals, those don't go away. Um, that is your accumulation of knowledge across the lifespan. So things like, um, you know, knowing, uh, I don't know, whatever it is that you know, um, things that you've learned in school if you were paying attention um, or should have known, um, those kinds of things are crystallized intelligence. Um, states and capitals, crystallized intelligence. If you ever knew them, you will continue to know them uh, later in life. So um, that kind of a thing. Um, so, um, and then the difference between an aptitude test and an achievement test. An achievement test tests your crystallized intelligence, how much you already know. Uh, an aptitude test purports to, or is supposed to, test your uh, general intelligence, your ability to learn something, and not what you've already learned. Um, the question there is, 
what is an aptitude test? How can I test your ability to learn something without also testing what you have learned about it? And so, um, so there's a controversy there about uh, uh, a struggle there with how to do that. Um, and stereotype threat we talked about in class and, and is well described in the book. So I'm not gonna go over that, but let me know if you have any questions about that. Um, motivation and emotion. Um, there's in, we're intrinsically motivated to do things that we really enjoy. We are extrinsically motivated to do things that we are rewarded for. Um, one of the problems with rewarding people for things that they already like to do is that it diminishes the value of that to them and you're substituting extrinsic motivation for something that they were previously intrinsically motivated to do and when the reward goes away their motivation to do that thing goes away so um, you have to be careful for example how you praise children for doing well at school um, because they really like school to start out with and they really want to do it but then if they start doing it just for the grades or just for the praise um, then uh, and the praise is um, sort of you know I'll give you this I'll, I'll give you money for grades I'll give you I'll take you out for a pizza dinner for grades um, then you start substituting extrinsic an extra extrinsic motivator for something that was previously intrinsically motivated. Um, Maslow's hierarchy hierarchy of needs has come up in several chapters. Um, uh, we have both incentives and drives that motivate our um, that motivate our uh, our actions. <clears throat> um, and then when you think about um, emotions uh, and people who are emotional and m emotion display rules. Um, it turns out that when you're talking about emotion, you really have to break it down into three categories. Um, the experience of emotion, how it feels to you, um, the expression of emotion, what you display to others, and then cognitively your understanding of that emotion. And those can be um, very separate things. You don't, you're not doing it all in the same way. Sometimes we feel emotions that we don't express. Sometimes we express emotions that we don't completely understand and so on. So it's important to um, to look at all three facets of facets of emotion when you're um, thinking about emotions. Um, chapter 10, gender and sexuality. Um, there's a lot of terminology associated with gender and sexuality, so I'd like you to be familiar with um, some of those, you know, gender schema, gender identity, gender role, um, and then um, just review the types of sexual orientation, just the main types. There are many more, and you know this, um, but um, homosexual, heterosexual, um, asexual and bisexual, um, there are many nuances among those and, and between those, um, but those are the four types that are discussed in your book, so I'm just going to keep our discussion to that. Um, and then the, both how biology and environment um, interact to influence uh, sexual orientation, because that's something that comes up a lot in the news, it comes up a lot in discussions, how did we arrive at the sexual orientation that we hold uh, as an individual uh, and what influenced that. Chapter 11 on stress and health um, talks about the general adaptation syndrome and the idea that um, there's an optimal level of stress that really motivates you to do things, um, but then uh, and that you sort of that you you go headlong into that, and while you're in that phase, um, you can work really hard and you can achieve all kinds of things that you didn't think that you could, but then at some point it will exhaust your system, um, and so that's the general adaptation system. Um, cognitive appraisals, um, trying to decide stress is not is in the mind of the beholder. Um, so what's stressful for me or what's stressful for you is not necessarily stressful for other people and it depends on their cognitive appraisal of that. Um, is it a threat to me and do I have some coping mechanisms for it? Um, and then if it is a stressful thing, am I going to use, and I have some coping strategy, am I going to use a problem focused coping strategy and try to address the problem in some way? And that's a great strategy or that's a great approach if it's something that you can do something about. If it's something that you can't control, that you can't do anything about, then emotion-focused coping can actually be the most adaptive um, stress coping strategy or uh, coping with stress strategy. Um, and that is making yourself feel about about the thing um, or distracting yourself from the thing or doing something to reduce the stress um, because it's something that you can't do anything about. Um, upward and so downward social comparison. Um, sometimes we compare ourselves to uh, people who are better than us and that makes us sort of feel bad sometimes and that's upward social comparison um, And so if you go into a room and you notice everybody who has some attribute that you don't have and that you wish you had um, They all know more than you about something or they're dressed better than you or you know Whatever it is that you're comparing yourself to somebody else um, and you're comparing yourself to the people who are above you um, That can be damaging to your self-esteem downward social comparison is looking around the room and saying well at least I'm not that at least I know this 
uh, and that uh, tends to elevate self-esteem. Now, neither of those strategies are good strategies to use all the time, obviously. Like, you don't want to walk around the world saying, well, at least I'm not you, or at least I'm better than you. I mean, that's not a great strategy. Um, but sometimes noticing where you fit, like if, you're, if you suffer from low self-esteem or if somebody does, um, sort of trying to figure out how they're comparing themselves to others. And it's like, well, perhaps you need to compare yourself not just to the people who, are, who have the thing that you want and don't have, but also the, the people who are also struggling like you and understand that, uh, that the human condition is, is, a, is a condition of struggle throughout the lifespan. Um, um, and then Seligman's PERMA model um, is the idea that, and we talked about this in class, um, that positive psychology isn't just about being happy, it's not just about smiley faces, um, but it's about um, you know, having positive emotions, um, have, being engaged in the things that you do, being rewarded for the things that you do, um, those kinds of things. So take a look at your notes for the PERMA model. If you've got more questions about that, let me know. But um, I think it's an interesting way and a, and a, uh, a informative way to think about positive psychology and the influence of positivity in our lives. Um, chapter 12 on social psychology, there's a lot of terminology in chapter 12, a lot of concepts. They interrelate, um, so I think this is one where um, looking at flashcards, looking at definitions can be important so that you understand what the thing is, how to use it in an example, and whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, because some of the things that sound like good things are not necessarily that great. Um, uh, one of the important things in, um, in social psychology, and social psychology is, the, is how individuals behave in the presence of a real or imagined group. Um, so it's how you behave in a group, or uh, if you feel like there's a group or you imagine a group, the group doesn't actually have to be there. Um, so uh, we have both personal and situational uh, influences on our, um, on our behavior, and so that, that can be important. The fundamental attribution error is the idea that um, we make attributions about people all the time, um, but we tend to uh, ascribe uh, personality variables to other people and situational variables to ourselves. Um, and so, and we fail to notice how the situation also influences us um, and them, and how personality influences us and them. So, um, the actor observer bias is that we treat ourselves, we know ourselves better. And so, when you say, "What, it, what is more influential um, to you?" The, you know, what, how, you know, what your beliefs are or the situation, and we say, "Well." Uh, it depends on the situation. Uh, and for other people, we say, well, they're a jerk. And, and we don't say, well, what was the situation that they were in when they were behaving in that way? Um, the self-fulfilling prophecy, um, expectation effects, the idea that um, sometimes when we expect something to happen um, in small ways, we elicit that behavior or elicit that response. Um, and it tends to be a self-fulfilling prophecy. We also tend to, we have a confirmation bias. We notice the things that uh, confirm our, our expectations, and we fail to notice as many things that disconfirm our, our uh, expectations. Um, stereotypes, um, a stereotype isn't on its face a bad thing. Uh, a stereotype is a heuristic. It's a mental shortcut um, that gives you some information about a situation, about a person. Um, it becomes discriminatory um, and prejudicial if you fail to correct for the actual person and the actual situation. So the stereotype itself isn't the bad thing, it's what you do with that information. If you're gonna use a heuristic or a mental shortcut to say, this person just walked into the room and they appear to be uh, a teenager and they're dressed in a particular way, I think they belong to this kind of a social group. Um, if you then talk to the person and correct for your um, assumptions, then that's all right. You know, it, it got you part of the way there and then you uh, and then you made your own decisions. But if you stop there and just say, here's what I think I know about you and here's how I'm gonna treat you, that's when you get um, discrimination and prejudice. Um, in group and outgroup bias, we did this in the class, um, the idea of minimal groups, um, that all you have to do is tell people that, um, that uh, you know, this group is you know, wearing this kind of clothes and you're wearing these kinds of clothes, why did they do that? And all of a sudden it becomes an us and them um, kind of a thing. And sometimes it devolves into criticism it's like, well, you know, they must not know as much as we do um, because we're, you know, we're the ones that made the right choice and had they known as much as us, they'd have made a choice like us too. Um, the jigsaw classroom um, is the idea that, you know, one way that you can um, increase fairness and increase um, uh, in good uh, working together, good um, team spirit, um, is to make everybody an expert in something um, and then let all of those experts go off and 
uh, learn more about their subject matter, and then bring it back to the group. So if everybody in your group is a subject matter expert on some different aspect of the group project, you all need each other and you work together better. Um, and so that fosters um, that sense of community uh, and fosters learning in the classroom. So. Um, the idea is to, uh, is to get people working together with diverse groups so that they don't uh, get stuck in their own group. Um, attitudes affect behavior and behavior affects attitudes. Um, you think that because you hold an attitude you behave in a particular way and you probably do. But it's also the case that if we can get you to change your behavior, and this is based on, on research, if we can get people to change their behavior and then we ask them later what their attitude is, it turns out that they report an attitude that's in line with that behavior because otherwise they'll experience cognitive dissonance. It's like, I believe this, but I did that. How do I make that, you know, how do I resolve that? Um, and so, you know, one way to resolve that is I look at my behavior and it's like, I get information from that. It's like, oh, I've been recycling. I must care about the earth. And really, you know, perhaps you weren't recycling until somebody gave you a recycling container and told you that you had to. Um, the mere exposure effect, um, the idea that just being around people uh, makes us like them better. Um, and so the familiarity with the people in your class uh, means that when you're in a class uh, with them next semester, um, that you'll like them just a little bit better than all of the other people in your class, um, even though you don't really know them particularly well or might not know them particularly well, but that um, just being exposed to them, just being around them uh, makes you like them better. Um, cognitive dissonance, um, a term for um, uh, holding two things that, you know, believing that you're a good person and then acting in a way that, that would say that you're not a good person and you have to in some way resolve that. And so cognitive dissonance is that feeling of two things that aren't compatible and cognitively using our thinking, we have to bring them in line um, in some way. Um, uh, justification of effort and insufficient, insufficient justification. Um, if we pay you to do something um, then, you know, then you might be willing to do it again. Um, if we pay you a lot um, versus when we pay you a little, um, that can have different impact on how you feel about the thing and your willingness to do it again. So if we only pay you a little, then you're saying, well, I must actually believe in this thing because I was willing to do it for a dollar and a dollar is nothing. If we pay you $30, however, um, you'll say, well, I just did it for the money. I didn't really believe it. And so um, sometimes, again, you have to be careful about how you reward people and understand the impact that that's going to have, and it's not always intuitive. So if you're ever in a position, um, if you work in HR, if you manage other people, if you're trying to decide how to reward people, remember the research on intrinsic and extrinsic motivation from the motivation chapter, and then also remember um, that there's a lot of research in social psychology about the influence of rewards on people, how to persuade people to do things, and how to motivate them to do things. Um, and so you can go back to your social psychology at that point and, and review it, just you know, knowing that it's out there. Um, social facilitation and social loafing. Um, social facilitation is when being a group in a group actually improves you. So when peer pressure sometimes improves your, um, your performance. Um, so social, that idea of facilitation, um, peer pressure isn't always a bad thing. Sometimes it's a good thing. Um, social loafing is when you've got five or six people in a group and each person's individual contribution isn't as obvious, and so um, they tend to loaf and just sort of sit back and let other people do the work. Where if you're working in a group with just two students, you and another student, it's hard to loaf because it will be patently obvious. Um, group polarization and group think, um, when you get into groups and people are trying to resolve an issue and there are two sides, um, people at the beginning might gravitate more towards the middle, but towards the end of the discussion, um, tend to polarize um, and go more in the direction of one or the other. Um, groupthink is the idea that sometimes you go along with the group because you don't want to disrupt things, because you value the cohesiveness of the group over the decision. Um, and groupthink sounds like a good thing, but it can be a very bad thing. So having somebody in your group or being that person in your group that will speak up and say, no, I don't think this is the right thing to do. No, I think we're making the wrong decision even though the people in the group might not want to hear it, even though it might make the meeting go longer, is an important thing to do. So fighting groupthink is a really important thing in groups. And if you're the leader of a group, um, but I hope that you will you know, use this to say, we need to value the people who are sort of thorny. We need to value the people who will speak up and, and say no um, if we're going in the wrong direction, because it doesn't benefit anyone if we go in the wrong direction. Um, and in some cases, um, using the examples in the book, it, you can make decisions that, um, that have long-term impacts that are negative.
Um, Sternberg's Triangular Theory of Love, um, I'm not going to go through this in depth. Um, if you look at my video channel and YouTube, there's a, like, I think a nine minute, seven or nine minute video on just that one. But um, we drew it as three interlocking circles. Um, and the components of love were uh, passion, intimacy, and commitment. And then we uh, identified eight different types of love, one of those being non-love, um, based on the presence or absence of each of those three components. So what is it if it just has one of each of the ones, um, any combination of two, and then all three would be consummate love. So if you need a refresher on that, there's a separate video on that. Um, chapter 13 on personality, and we talked about um, how personality traits are enduring aspects of, of how you react across situations and across time. So if it's something that you just do once or you just do when you're in a bad mood, that's what we call a state. Um, but traits endure and, um, and are present across many situations. It isn't that you are always extroverted if you're relatively extroverted, but that you're consistently extroverted across a variety of situations. That would be a personality trait. Um, um, Self-serving biases, um, you know, you can look that one up in the book. Um, the idea that we judge ourselves different than we judge other people. Um, the, uh, there are different ways of thinking about uh, personality. One is Freudian theory. Um, do not spend any time on the psychosexual stages, but do look at the id, ego, and superego, and the idea of uh, levels of conscious awareness. Um, also defense mechanisms, you know, the fact that we're defending our ego, defending our reality, trying to explain our own behavior or deal with things um, in order to feel better about ourselves. Um, and so defense mechanisms that we commonly use are things like repressing things that we find upsetting to us or denying things that we don't want to think about or, uh, and, and, you know, just using denial to say that didn't happen, um, you know, uh, you know, projection, projecting it onto somebody else. It's not that I hate you, it's you that you hate me. Um, so those kinds of things. So there are a number of defense mechanisms that we talked about in class and also that are um, listed in the book. Um, the, uh, the two main theories of personality that I wanted you to take away from this course are um, the biological theory, the idea that there are certain aspects of your personality that you were born with and that you can't do a lot about. Um, and that influenced how you developed across the lifespan and, and how your personality has played out as an adult. Um, personality is relatively stable in adulthood. It doesn't mean that you can't change things, um, but unless you actually try to change something or you're in a situation that's traumatic, um, you are unlikely to change uh, your personality in important ways. You know, it, it continues to develop, um, but you tend to stay in the same vein. So if you were more extroverted than other people before, um, you remain more extroverted than your peers um, across, um, across time. Um, so that's the biological theory. The, um, the trait theory um, is, the, <coughs> is based on Costa and McRae's research on the big five. And the acronym we use that for that is OCEAN, um, but it's openness to experience, conscientiousness, agreeableness, neuroticism, which is another word for anxiety, um, and um, extroversion. Um, so take a look at those, um, look at what the components are and make sure that you understand um, how it relates to you. You know, when you go back to memory, um, elaborate, elaborative rehearsal. Um, if you can make examples of these things with respect to your own personality, you'll remember them better. Um, and then um, different ways that we um, assess personality. We talked in class about projective tests like the thematic apperception test or the Rorschach ink blot test. Um, so that's where you're projecting, you're, you're making a story about something and that tells us something about how you think and who you are versus um, asking you for a self-report, how, you know, how do you behave in certain situations um, or asking someone to observe you, either somebody who knows you well or an experimenter could watch you in a variety of situations. So uh, for personality, you're the best uh, judge of you. You've got the most information about you. So a lot of personality assessments are based on self-report. Not all of them, but a lot of them are um, because you're the one that has the most information and it's hard for us to see how you feel. Um, even if you act in an introverted way or an extroverted way, or even if you act in an agreeable way or a less agreeable way, we don't necessarily know across as many situations as the information that you have about yourself. Okay, the last two chapters um, on disorders and their treatments, I'd like to keep that at a relatively high level. Um, I think it's important for you to know the classes or the different types of um, 
of disorders. Um, the idea that something is diagnosed as a disorder or considered a disorder, um, if it meets the criteria of being deviant from the norm, of being distressful to the person or should be distressful to the person if they you know, were aware of, of the impact that it has. Um, and then also dysfunctional, that it impedes your ability to you know, conduct daily life in some way. Um, so um, look at the different classes of disorders and some of the symptoms so that you can see that there are anxiety disorders and there are depressive disorders and there are um, there's bipolar disorder and, and a number of disorders. So the ones that I listed in the study guide are the ones that I would review. Um, there are lots of disorders. I brought the DSM to class. It's this big. There are, there are many disorders, many diagnosed disorders. I'm not going to hold you responsible for all of them. If you're interested in disorders, I would encourage you to take um, Psych 281 at Wake Tech or a class you know, further on in your academic career in um, abnormal psychology where you can um, do a deeper dive and get more information about these disorders and how they're treated. Um, for treatments, look at the different types of psychotherapies that are involved. Um, sometimes it involves drugs, sometimes it involves talking, sometimes it's um, cognitive behavioral therapy. So just an awareness of the definitions of those different types so that if somebody tells you um, it's hard to go through life without talking to somebody who's being treated for something. Many people at some point in their adult life will be treated for some sort of a psychological disorder. Um, so being conversant in these things I think is helpful um, in a social way and also in a personal way if it's somebody um, that you know or um, somebody in your family. I don't expect you to be able to identify drugs by name. I don't think that's important unless it's important to you um, in your own life. Um, um, a little bit of information about ECT or electroconvulsive therapy, um, TMS or transcranial magnetic theory um, uh, treatment or um, stimulation and deep brain stimulation, DBS, um, are all treatments of last resort essentially uh, for the things that they try to treat. So nobody, um, using the example of deep brain stimulation, you implant something inside the brain that can stimulate the brain um, and hopefully change certain things. So uh, if somebody suffers from, for example, um, Parkinson's disease, um, a lack of uh, adequate dopamine in certain regions of the brain, and so it, um, deep brain stimulation uh, would be put inside the brain and you could uh, adjust that to try and stimulate the brain to, uh, to make more dopamine available in the brain to the person. Um, so again, that, you know, that's not, you know, if you could do that with drugs without doing brain surgery, you would definitely do that. So keep in mind that some of these more extreme treatments are the last treatment. Um, if somebody suffers from major depression that has not responded to anything else, they might um, be offered electroconvulsive therapy. Um, that's not going to be the first thing that they're offered. The first thing that they're going to be offered is probably um, talking to people, counseling, uh, medications, some combination of those things. So, um, so keep that in mind when you're, you're thinking about these different treatments. Um, we watched in class a video on, um, on treatment for a specific phobia um, and how getting more information about something and then being exposed to it and flooding your system but to the point of exhaustion and then remaining in the room uh, lets you learn that, um, a form of cognitive behavioral therapy lets you learn that um, that the thing is not going to kill you and you were in the situation and it did not kill you um, and then you were able to end the session um, you know your system had been exhausted so you couldn't have that anxiety that physiological anxiety response anymore and so you ended it on a good note and so that's an example of how you can use these therapies to treat and in some cases depending on the disorder cure disorders um, but not all disorders can be cured um, and not all disorders can even be managed effectively um, with combinations of drugs and, and treatment. So um, I identified a few, um, and then I'd like you to at least be aware of what therapies tend to work with what disorders. So when you think about anxiety disorders, think about cognitive behavioral therapy. When you think about depressive disorders, think about some combination of cognitive behavioral therapy or, um, or medications or um, TMS or DBS um, or even ECT in extreme cases. Um, for bipolar disorder, it tends to be um, medication that works and therapy doesn't seem to work. Talk therapy doesn't seem to work. Um, schizophrenia and antipsychotic medication tends to work if it works at all. But, uh, but again, talk therapy doesn't seem to work because it seems to have a biological um, underpinning. And so talking about it doesn't change the biology of it. 
um, borderline personality disorder, uh, a dialectical behavioral therapy. Um, so you know, just different, uh, different kinds of things. Um, and then lastly, and then I'm gonna wrap up here, uh, I put a list at the end um, of famous studies. Um, so if you're not familiar with any of those um, or, or um, the trite phrases that we talked about in the first few weeks of the semester, um, if you're not sure what they mean and how to apply them, um, let me know because those are the kinds of things that make their way into the news or, or as a reference in a news article um, almost every year. Like it, it's, it's hard to go through a year without seeing that get referred to in the news in some way. And so having a familiarity with it so that when somebody says Little Albert or the Bobo doll study or um, the Stanford prison experiment, you know what it is that they're talking about. Um, so, okay. So good luck on your test. Um, and if you have any questions between now and then, let me know. Thanks. Bye.